Hello everyone, welcome back to Harp Tuesday. Um, it's been a little bit, this is actually Wednesday, July 20th, 2011, and what with one thing or another, I uh, haven't managed to get an episode uploaded for longer than I would like. So this episode is going to be the first of a two-part look at um, Carlos Salcedo's Song in the Night, which comes from a method for Harp. Uh, it's the, uh, the final piece in the book. And before I talk about that, a couple quick announcements. Um, I'm going to be playing at the World Harp Congress, which is a week-long celebration of harp music that takes place every three years. And this year it's in Vancouver, BC. It's coming up the week of July 24th, so very soon. And I'm going to be playing a, a so-called coffee concert, a morning concert, um, on Monday the 25th. So I'll, I'll be playing Marion Mosetish's Songs of Nymphs, which is a wonderful piece. And uh, if you're going to be attending the concert, I hope that you'll say hi afterwards. So I also just uploaded the first movement of the Songs of Nymphs, the prelude, to YouTube. So I invite you to take a look at that. And I also just uploaded uh, uh, me playing Song in the Night. So that's something to take a look at. Perhaps before we get into the piece itself, go and uh, take a listen, take a look. And Salzano's Song in the Night is a piece that's, um, it's kind of goofy. It's kind of goofy. It, uh, it shows off some of the more unusual sound effects that you can get on the harp. It's, you know, Salzado was trying to sort of standardize some of the harp notation and all these various kind of wild effects that, you know, as we started to get 20th century contemporary music and people were looking at some of these more outlandish effects. And so this is, this piece is really sort of a a showpiece for some of these different effects and notation. And I'm going to be referring to, this is easier for me to play from, easier to turn pages with this. Um, and uh, the piece itself is a great piece for educational or school concerts. And it's a piece that's not actually that hard to play, but sounds impressive. So it's, it's a good piece to know. And as I say, it's a great piece to show off sort of the the more out of the way sounds that you can get on the harp. So let's dive right in. And we start with um, this little section. And, and there is just try to be aware of how the, how it's um, marked out in terms of the rhythm. Because, because of the notes, we have this repeated E flat or D sharp. It's really easy to hear that is one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four. But it's actually one, two, three, one, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one. And then we get, you know, one, two, three, four, and five. And that second beat on that bar right here, I would play it as if, uh, I think oftentimes you'll see that in, in contemporary music often as sort of the, um, it's uh, kind of like a hairpin, but a hairpin for um, for length. You know, it's the the um, amount of stems that are gradually getting bigger, so that instead of a strict rhythm, it's just gradually getting faster, and we get through these those seven notes um, in the space of one big beat, and gradually getting faster, so that it's. Then 
we get a gliss, and I know last episode was about glisses, but here's something that I didn't talk about, and that is getting out of a gliss with this 234 business. So it's a very, it's quite a slow gliss, this first one. And then he has 234 marked down here, so that you're glissing down. And the theory behind that is it's a way of coming out of that gliss and making sure that you're going to be landing on that final note and not just some note in there and making that end being quite defined, fairly crisp and precise. So it takes a little bit of practice just to... practicing as you get down near enough, placing those notes and then being able to gliss into them. So you can, you can, you know, practice, maybe place your thumb, place these guys. Something like that. So we get that. That's obviously going to be a slightly faster gliss because it's their more longer span to cover. And then we get these double harmonics. Now, I don't think, I think I did an episode on harmonics and I don't think I mentioned these guys. And that's where you're playing a chord. You're playing two strings and trying to make a harmonic with both of them. So uh, let's see, you can't really see, but what I'm trying to do is hold both strings with my palm and then play both of them. So, you know, I try to get that in the center. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, and the motion here is kind of a pinching motion. So it's a little bit different than we might normally do, but it's just And it's th those double harmonics I always find kind of annoying and a little awkward because of course it's it's really hard like let's say this uh, in this case they're both flats but let's say this C was a sharp or something and and you needed that middle point of course is going to be lower um, and this one you know it's it's hard to sort of adjust your midpoints because there's only so much wiggle room you have um, and, and you know it's a decent decent sound it's it's I have a hard time getting it to sound consistently as good as if I were playing it with two hands but um, it's a, a good skill to have so again just this sort of pinching motion and and trying to make sure that you're not releasing one side or the other too quickly so there's not a or a that both of them are actually harmonics. So there's that, we go. And with this little rundown, just the thing to be aware of is the, that constant sound so that it's not, there's no gap between hands. And we got this big, vigorous gliss. near the soundboard and again these these double harmonics um, and left hand glisses more doubled and then here we get this uh, two-fingered gliss So a couple things here. First of all is just the rhythm so that we have one, two, or sorry, so we have one, two, and three, and four, one, um, and 
it, so just be aware of the fact that even though this note is marked as a, as a whole note, of course there is that rest above it for the separate line for these. So we have one, two, and three, and four, one. And then we get these uh, fingernail sounds. So with fingernail sounds, you're just playing it as you might expect um, with a fingernail. Here's the, if you haven't come across it before, this kind of fingernail shaped symbol. And the, you want to play them as near to the soundboard as, as is comfortable. Um, you don't, it's not like you need long fingernails. In fact, long fingernails can be risky. You just want, you know, just that short fingernail. Um, Put the fingernail on the string. No, you can't really see that, can you? Uh, let's, tr let's try this up here. Um, so it takes a little bit of a little bit of practice because it's a matter of being able to quickly place it and play it. And I know because I very rarely play with my fingernails whenever I look to do this piece again, um, I just have to take a moment with those fingernail sections and make sure that I'm able to find and place the notes that I'm playing quickly enough. So it's, it's not as much, you know, playing it is fine. It's being able to find and, and, and prepare yourself to play it with, at the sort of speed that you would be able to grab a normal note. So then we get these these uh, fingernail glisses down, where we're grabbing roughly a third here and a second here, so that it's... And of course, um, Salzedo liked to write his harmonics where they sounded, so that when he's writing this harmonic, um, right here, this harmonic here, it's actually being played down here, um, and actually, I, I, which is, it's always kind of annoying to try to remember who what who writes which way. In general, unless otherwise notated, you will find that um, harmonics are written where they're played. But if you're if you're ever writing something for the harp, you should definitely include a note as to what your harmonics are doing, whether they're being written as played or written where they sound. Um, we wander our way up, some plonk, plonk, plonks, and we get this fingernail section again, and this is with both hands, so again, it's a little bit trickier. And I wouldn't want, see, I wouldn't want to be able, I wouldn't want to, I'd have to practice a fair amount to play that a lot faster. That's a comfortable tempo for me, and it is, it's quite slow. But again, it's just that trickiness of, of, of being able to actually find them and, 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 and place those fingernails. So, and then, well, we got, we finish it off with these really high harmonics. It's this G up here. Uh, There we go. And I would say what helps me sometimes with harmonics on these really small strings is to think about shortening the harmonic a little bit, the, the spacing, so that normally there'd be a, a nice space here between the finger and the thumb. But as we creep up, you know, you can't really get that in the same way, so the hand almost gets cramped a little bit. And of course, it becomes even more important with these little small strings to be aware of are you sharp, flat, or natural, because that is going to change, you know, that space is a slightly larger percentage of the whole. It's going to change where that center point is. So, let's 
trying to lock in on that spot because it's a it's a very narrow spot on a big string like this oh you got some leeway maybe it's not going to be perfect but you definitely have some leeway to get a pretty decent sounding harmonic when you're talking this little string it's either really good or it's it's it's, it's there's nothing so trying to lock in on that sweet spot and just nail those harmonics um and that's it for this sort of first section so it's been wow it's been 15 minutes already um and i think i will leave it there and next week uh, finish this off <laughs>